the subject now in this uh, short address is the seeker's struggles. Seekers after God have struggles. Now here is one of the sayings of Christ which has a dual sense and is meant to have a dual sense. And the Lord Jesus Christ uttered the same words on another occasion recorded in the Gospel of Luke, very similar words, but by bringing the two passages together, you can see very clearly the two senses. First of all here in verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Well, it did. John the Baptist, when he began his preaching, preaching the need for repentance, putting his finger on the ills of society, and yet he attracted vast crowds, multitudes, tens of thousands would listen to him at any time. Well, he stirred up the establishment. The religious establishment were furious with him. They were hypocrites and they hated his preaching. They were stuck, they couldn't speak against him because the people for the time being were all for him. They couldn't uh, criticize him, but on the other hand, they loathed what he was saying. And it came to the point where he spoke very directly, person to person to Herod the king, and he rebuked him for his infidelity and his wrongdoing and Herod arrested him and later executed him. So the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the preachers suffered violence, at any rate, from the establishment, if not at the early stage, from the ordinary common people. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. The first meaning of the passage, which is intended, as I said, to have Two meanings, a dual sense. The first meaning, the Lord Jesus Christ does this on several occasions, and there is a clear meaning, and then there is another meaning, a spiritual meaning. And this first meaning is simply this, that not only is there persecution for preaching which calls people to repent and to seek and find the Lord and to know him in a real relationship, but also... People who are hypocrites seize the kingdom of God by force. Well, of course, they can't, really. You can't seize heaven by force. You can't bludgeon your way into God's favor and into heaven. But on earth, you can seize hold of the church or try to. And you can grab it and try to control it. And that's exactly what the hypocritical religious leaders of that time did with the Jewish church. And they took it for themselves and their own aggrandizement and gain. And so the first sense of the passage is that there would be persecution and false people trying to get in and seize control of the church as they did seize control of the temple and the synagogues in those days. But then there's a second meaning and this is the one that concerns us. And in Luke's gospel, a similar passage runs that since John, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. And the secondary sense is this, that the kingdom of God must be entered by, if you like, violence and force. But here's this subtle second meaning to the disciples, to the Christians, to the people who are seeking after the Lord, that to get into the kingdom of God, to Christ's kingdom, there has got to be some pressure on your part you have to press your way in. The meaning is this, that nobody ever got into the kingdom of God and into heaven and into God's favor by lethargy or indifference or complacency or half-heartedness. That's impossible. You can't become a Christian. You can't 
secure the favor and the kindness of God and a place in heaven by lukewarm approach and casual attitudes, you have to press. Now, I'll explain this because here is a, a paradox. On the one hand, salvation is all of grace. That's the teaching of the Bible, from cover to cover. It is entirely of grace. In other words, it's a matter of receiving God's favor, undeserved favor and kindness freely from him. We cannot earn it. We cannot deserve it. He is holy. We are corrupt, depraved and sinful. We are selfish and deceitful and often violent and so proud. And even though there are some good deeds in us, and some nice attitudes, and some pleasant attitudes. Nevertheless, we know our hearts, and we are not fit for God. And anybody who thinks he or she is fit for the Holy One, for God, is either incredibly conceited or at least misguided. No, we cannot earn God's favor. We must come to him as lost sinners. We must trust that Christ has purchased salvation for those who come. Christ, equal with the Father, came from heaven to earth, lived a perfect life on earth, allowed himself in apparent weakness, he could have resisted it had he chosen to be arrested, and then to go through a grossly unjust trial, and then to be nailed to Calvary's cross, where he would suffer a punishment far, far greater than that of being nailed to a cross, in that his father would put upon him all the guilt of those for whom he would die, those for whom he would be a substitute, a sin bearer, and punish him with the eternal punishment of sin instead of them. And by doing that, he purchased the right to forgive us when we come to him and repent of our sin and trust in him. So salvation has to be given to us freely. We never deserve it. We cannot earn it. We must receive it freely from God, trusting in Christ as our substitute, our sin bearer, and give our lives to him. So that's one side of, the, of this, that salvation must be free. And yet I'm saying something which may appear to contradict that. At the same time, you've got to press into the kingdom. You've got to press. Well, is this a contradiction? No, because your pressing into the kingdom cannot deserve any favor from God. It cannot atone for any tiny fraction of our sin it cannot merit eternal life and deserve God's kindness in that respect either. But nevertheless, we have to press into it. And that's what I want to explain. It's the secondary meaning of this text. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. That is to say, people who are determined press into it and seek and find the free favor of Christ. Well, why must we press in? Well, there are problems. They're in our hearts. The trouble is that uh, it's hard for us often to leave the old life. I've built up my past life. It was for me. It's a life of sin. It's a life of selfishness and self-seeking. It's all for me, and I'm very attached to it. I like my habits. I like my sins. I like my selfish ambitions. I like the way I am. Now, to have free salvation from Christ, I must turn my back on it. I must leave it and be prepared for, I can't even do that, but be prepared for him to take me from it. I don't want to go. I don't want to give it up. I'm proud of my old life. I'm proud of myself. That's the trouble, I'm a proud sinner. I cling to these things. 
So there are some hard things, even though they don't deserve or earn anything, there are some hard things for us to do, to press into the kingdom and to cry to the Lord to forgive us and save us and to help us turn our backs on that old life. And you can't get into the kingdom without that kind of battle, without being holy, ready to lean on Christ. It's like a rescue. If you're on an aeroplane and it's taking off and it gets into trouble on the runway, I don't want to put bad ideas into your heads and make you uncomfortable. And the pilot has to slam on the brakes or whatever he does and the nose goes down into the tarmac and a smell of burning fills the cabin and the doors open and the chutes go out. You don't say, just a minute, I've got some baggage up here. I've got to take my case and my papers. You're out of that plane before you choke to death and the flames burst out. It's an escape, it's a rescue. You can't take anything with you. And so it is with entering the kingdom. You can't take all your baggage, all your sins, all your old delights. You can't take your bad temper. You've got to pray for the Lord to help you lose it. You've got to leave all the things you were so attached to and go in, escape without them. That's what it's about. If you climb a mountain, you go on holiday, and you're going up a mountain, <laughs> some people, when they go on holiday, they seem to want to take with them in their bags everything they've ever owned. And uh, you see so many bags going off to the coach station at the airport and so on. Well, if you're climbing a mountain, you can't say, ah, halfway up, I may need this. And I may need that, and I may want to brew up, and, and I'll take this, and I'll take that. And you'll have half a ton. You'll never get a third of the way on that steep walk. You've got to leave things behind. And coming into the kingdom of God, there are things to leave behind. And that's a struggle. That's a struggle. We've got to renounce our pride and what we imagine and our, our accomplishments and so on. Entering the kingdom sometimes is drawn out because of that struggle. Some little while ago, I was reading the diaries uh, of William Wilberforce. I read them before, extracts from them. And concerning how he became a Christian, how he came to faith in God, it took him months. It really took him months to find the Lord. He knew he needed the forgiveness of God. He knew he needed a new heart and a new life. But his prayers were not answered and he couldn't get anywhere. And slowly but surely he came to see why. He wasn't willing to part with his pride, with the things he relished most in public life. He didn't give up public life, but he was in public life for what it meant to his ego and his pride. He didn't want to give these things up. And he was a long trek of discovering what it was he was clinging on to before he really gave his life and his heart to God and repented of his sin and found Christ and then the difference it made. Sometimes it is a struggle and it takes time. Once he came to Christ in sincere repentance, it was all so quick. God changed him dramatically and made himself known to him. And he was such a happy man. But it took time for him to get there. The trouble is always on our side, not the Lord's side. So there was him. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes people come very suddenly. Now, there's something which hasn't entered any of the biographies, but you probably have heard the name of John Reith. Well, Lord Reith, before he died in 1971. It's ancient history now, I suppose. But uh, he was, uh, at the beginning of the 1920s, made the general manager and boss and ultimately the director general of the BBC. Really, he created the BBC. He was the one who wrote its charter, formed it, put early principles into it. He was the one who persuaded government that there ought to be a broadcasting authority that was independent of government control and all that sort of thing. No one else thought of this. This was entirely him. 
But he wasn't a, really a Christian man. He was a moral man. His father had been a Presbyterian minister. He was Scottish. He was a very powerful man, John Reith. In fact, I think it was in 1915, when he was a young officer in World War I, he was hit by a bullet in the face, in the cheek, and it gave him this most, if you've ever seen pictures of him, formidable scar that made him look so fierce. And in a way, he was fierce. But he was always at the top of society, whether it was chief of the BBC in his day, or, uh, by the way, I'm speaking of days before my time. Uh, don't let, mustn't let myself sound too much of an authority on this. But however, uh, all his life, you read his biography, he's, he's reaching for some greater fulfillment or satisfaction. He, he's a driven man. He thinks himself underused. And so he has this discontent running in him all his life. And it was only a year or so before his death when he was present in a Christian meeting held in a room in the Bonington Hotel just north of the river there when he heard a message he'd known from childhood, but for the first time he realized this was what was missing in his life, the forgiveness of sin, the pardon of God, to be yielded entirely to him, to be in his service, and the difference it made. But when it happened and he was converted, it was literally within minutes, seconds of hearing that address. For some people, it takes a time. It's a big fight. For others, they've had their fight. And there's no better news they could possibly hear but that Christ will take away their sin and give them new life and a new beginning. Oh, dear friends, sometimes you can see both processes over time and then a sudden conversion. Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, it is hard for thee, said God to him, to kick against the pricks or the goads. Even as he persecuted Christians on behalf of the Jewish church, he was troubled and distressed and wondered if he was doing the right thing. His bigotry drove him on, but he was in trouble and God was dealing with him. And then on that Damascus road, God dealt with him in a very remarkable way and he was humbled and fell before God and sought his pardoning love and became a new man. And the relentless, persecuting bigot of a man became the most generous-hearted, self-sacrificial servant of souls and helper of others to his dying day. So there's an instance of a conversion that probably had a long preparatory preliminary process and a troubled heart and then a sudden yielding. But whatever it is, oh, conversion is a great moment when we press. And I'm going to tell you as briefly as I can some of the elements of this pressing into the kingdom of God. Oh, friends, you see it with Luther. Martin Luther became a monk, had a burden on his heart that pressed him forward. Oh, to be clean, to be accepted by God, to know I'm going to heaven. Even as a monk, he had no certainty. He had no assurance. He was always anxious. And then, of course, he's a young scholar. He's appointed as a university lecturer. And he begins to lecture on, on the Psalms. And he gets flashes of light. He can see that David and other Psalm writers, they didn't do penances. They didn't have to earn their salvation. They believed it came freely from God. And then he was giving a series of lectures in the theological seminary on Paul's letter to the Romans. And he saw it. Justification by faith alone, through faith in Christ. And God, Christ, has done it all in suffering and dying on Calvary. And he came to God in an instant. Why, before that time, he would infuriate his confessor. He went to his Catholic confessor every day with a string of sins to confess. 
And a very notable uh, man named uh, von Staupitz said to him uh, one day, why do you bring me all these trivial sins? Do something serious and come to me. Make your confession worthwhile, he said to him. Oh, but Luther was a burdened man. And this is one of the first things that happens when we want to press to the kingdom. We press because we're under a burden of conviction. You can treat God lightly. You can listen to me lightly. You can just half an ear. Why should you respect me? Why should you listen to the preaching of the word of God? But when conviction descends upon your heart, I am a sinner. I am condemned by God. I will be under judgment. Then there's a new pressure and force. I've got to listen. I've got to know the way of salvation. I've got to find the Lord. This is the sort of pressure we mean. The violent take the kingdom by force. There is concern and pressure and desire, and it's very strong. You come under conviction of sin. It's God working in your heart. You say like Charles Wesley, the hymn writer, just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness. False and full of sin I am. Thou art full of truth and grace. I must be forgiven. I must receive new life. I must come to know him, the Lord of glory. Dear friends, that's the thing, the force of conviction. There's another force too. Well, the force of desire. I must be converted. I desire a new life, a new beginning, a new nature, a new character. I've come to the point where I can't stand myself. One person may say, I can't stand my temper. Another person may say, I can't stand my pride. What can I do about it? How can I get rid of it? Another will say, well, oh, this is my sin. I long to be clean and accepted by God. A strong desire, not only conviction, or to be changed, to be fresh, to walk with God, to have the power to pray, to know him and to prove him. And uh, that takes you, humbles you, brings you to the Lord in true repentance and asking for forgiveness. I remember reading years ago, and I realized this applied to me. I'm going back, oh, 58 years when I was a lad of 17, and I had never given any attention to spiritual things at all just rather in contempt of them. I suppose, I don't know that it was true to say I was an atheist, but I was pretty near to being that, certainly completely indifferent. And then I began to be concerned by various influences that I won't mention now. And I wanted to be received by God and forgiven. And I tried praying and I began. I heard the message of salvation. I knew what I must do. And then I read this little book by a man with a strange name, Charles Galladay Trumbull. He's an American man, lived in the 19th century. He was a businessman. He made money by, as far as I know, entirely ethical means. And then he became, and this is what he was famous for among the churches, a very powerful promoter of Sunday schools in the United States and of great force in the movement to begin and enlarge Sunday schools there. But this, when he, he was writing about his conversion, and I realized that I was making the mistake that he made, because he said that for months he prayed for conversion. He repented of his sin. He prayed for new life from God, and nothing happened. Nothing happened, nothing happened. And he was in despair and ready to give up. And then he realized, somebody in a sermon said something and it made him realize that this was his mistake. 
He was trying to will himself into the kingdom of God. He was trying to project himself into a spiritual experience. He would pray with his eyes tight closed and he would be very intense in his approach and he realized what I am doing, I never meant to do this, I'm trying to work up some sense of God, some sense of acceptance, some sense of a conversion process. And he realized that he had to give all that up and just come simply before God and humbly and trust him. And if he believed in Christ and his great love and his suffering and death, and if he sincerely repented of his sin insofar as he knew it and recognized it and trusted God's word, took him at his word, the promises of God to save, then God would take care of his conversion. And that is what happened. And that's a lesson of how we come. I think I was doing the same thing and realized it. I wonder if any of you are doing this. You think you've got to project yourself into spiritual experience and into the kingdom. It's not that kind of force. You can't do that. The force comes in this respect that no matter what discouragements, you trust God and you keep going. Some people are pressing to understand. We get all kinds of questions. And uh, even sometimes people who've been coming to church for ages, they'll say, but why Calvary? Why Calvary? Is there no other way of salvation? Why is there only one way? Well, of course there's only one way, dear friends. Doubts come into our minds. Queries come in. And you've got to press forward to make sure you get answers to help you and that you really understand. Oh, yes, only Calvary, because our sin must be punished. God is holy. His justice is perfect. He cannot just forget our sin or let us off. It must be punished. How is it going to be punished? Be punished. If I am to take the punishment, I will suffer that punishment in eternal condemnation. Is there any human being who can suffer it for, for me? No. There is one, and he is God as well as man. Christ took upon himself human flesh and constitution and personality and became a man so that he could suffer exactly what I should suffer in my place. A man alone couldn't do it. It would destroy him eternally. But the divinity of Christ and his perfection sustained him and his humanity paid the price and rendered the atonement for us. That is the only way. God must punish our sin and if he wishes to be kind to us and forgive us our sin, a member of the Godhead must come and take the punishment himself on our behalf. Have you ever heard kindness like that? Have you ever heard mercy like that? Oh, dear friends, if God works in your heart, that will move you, and deeply, that God should do such a thing for creatures like us, that some total of all human love, kindness, and humanity cannot begin to match this mighty act of God. Its kindness is so great. That's the only way whereby sin may be washed away and forgiven. So when you ask, why Calvary? Can you think of another way that would satisfy the honor and justice and integrity of God and yet save souls 
and show kindness. There is no other way. Don't be put off. Press. If you've got doubts, ask the questions. Ask for solutions. Press forward. You must find Christ. There is an answer and a clear answer in the word of God to every human doubt. Every doubt that the devil throws into our minds. Press forward. Ask. And we'll help. Because the thing of most importance is that you come to Christ. My time is up. You must press past the opposition. The opposition that is presented by scornful friends. What will he say? What will she say if he or she knew I was seeking Christ and new life and heaven and forgiveness? Press past the opposition that fear of friends presents. So you've got to do some pressing. The kingdom of heaven is entered by pressing forward, even though it's free, even though Christ must do it all for you, even though you can't earn it or deserve it. It must be free. There is some pressing for you to do. Press past the temptations, that selfish ambition, that's so important to you. You can't be a Christian and pursue that. That proud ambition you have, maybe to be famous for something that is not consistent with godliness and the Christian walk. Some sin you've come to love. Oh, dear friends, press forward. I must come to conclusion, but let me tell you what was troubling one friend who was seeking Christ he said this, how can I trust an invisible God? You speak about God's love. You speak about God's mercy. You speak about having his forgiveness and he will change my life if I trust him and he will guide me to heavenly glory. But he's invisible. How can I repose and place my trust in the invisible God? Oh, well, that may be a problem to you, but let me remind you, and as kindly as I can, that God is not that invisible, because while you cannot see him, Christ has come. You have the record of Christ. You have his unprecedented love demonstrated, his magnificent, perpetual healing ministries. You have the love of God demonstrated in all that he did. You have the record of his going to Calvary. He came. He appeared. He did all that so that it wouldn't be entirely invisible. What God is ready to do for souls and his great love and compassion was all done publicly to be recorded for us to see. And even today, it isn't entirely invisible because all your Christian acquaintances and friends will tell you, this is my experience from the day I came to Christ. He has helped me and guided me and blessed me and answered my prayers, not for selfish things, but for other people and all kinds of things. And I have this river of proof running through my life. Hey, plenty of people can tell you that to trust the invisible God brings the most visible evidences and proofs almost every step of life's journey. You can trust him, dear friends. No one ever came to him in vain and turned their life over to him without his blessing them. May you know the pressing force of conviction I must be forgiven. Of desire, I need new life and a walk with God. May you press past all the opposition and the discouragement and trust in Christ. And I close, you give him your pride and your sin and your selfish ambitions, not your unselfish ambitions, and your earthly excesses, 
You pass that all over to him for him to put on the scrap heap of the past. And what he will give you in exchange is pardon. Your soul will be clean. Communion with himself, interaction with the living God. Heaven, citizenship in heaven, new life, a new character, a new nature, spiritual life, the power to pray, purpose, guidance, so many things you will receive freely from God. Just remember this, friends. Salvation is free. It must be free, unearned, undeserved, purchased and secured by Christ alone. But I must press past the barriers, press forward with great desire and long for that forgiving touch and that new life which comes from Christ when we trust him. Here's the text. We've been looking at the secondary meaning from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. There's a bad sense, there's a good sense. People press into it. Present yourself at the door of the kingdom. Go to Calvary's cross by faith. Kneel before Christ. Ask for his forgiving love. Hand over your life to him. Ask him to make you his child and transform you. And he will entirely. Him that cometh to me, said Christ, I will in no wise cast out. Let's pray. Oh God, our gracious heavenly Father, look upon us all in this place. Again this night we pray that thou wilt not let any of us go out into the night, never to think of these things again, but to be swept away by the affairs of this life. O oh Lord, make our eternal souls most precious in our estimation. Grant us deep concern and longing and desire that we may press into the kingdom and trust Christ, our Saviour. We ask it in his name, for his sake. Amen.